Hello, this is Alex Calvo Garcia. You're listening to the Iron Hour podcast. Welcome once again to another episode of the Iron Hour podcast. I've got two of my usual panelists so far. We might be getting joined later on by Gareth, but so far for now, we have Marco Poliga, local entrepreneur. I'll take that, yeah. Hi, everyone. And everybody's favourite, the man we all love to hate, Mr. Max Bell. How you doing, Max? I like how you called Marco an entrepreneur rather than an entrepreneur. Is this yeah. how the Italians say it? Yeah, we just don't want to be French. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If there's, there's some... if, if there's anything that you can eat as all, you're not as all taking the mick out of French. <laughs> <laughs> and we might be getting joined by Gareth a little bit later on in the podcast. We are recording this on Thursday evening, and I believe he's on bedtime duty. So, who knows? <laughs> We've all got responsibilities, guys. Right, so coming up on today's episode, we review the Russia Olympic game on Tuesday night. Fantastic game that was. We discuss a very special Iron fan and his amazing work. We talk nominations. We have our usual Spy in the Camp segment, which this week's features Rob Irwin, media guy at Southport FC. We preview the upcoming game with Southport. And we have some questions from the fans, which we didn't get around to earlier on in the week. And we finish off with an FPL update from Marco. So let's start at the obvious place. Fantastic result for the Iron Max on Tuesday night. And a good performance, particularly in the second half. Yeah, I thought something clicked in the second half. Um, we previously talked on the pod about how in too many games we were playing really a 5-3-2. And I thought that was a big difference because them all sorts of problems in the second half down the right hand side. If anybody wants to produce a heat map of that game after the break, I'd be confident that Barrows' average position was much, much higher than it was in the first <clears> half, and especially against Chester. I thought the overlapping runs, you know, not just his end position, but his start position, his his balls back into the box were were really, really threatening. And, you know, Russia did their best, but they um they couldn't deal with him. And, you know, it was a it was a good result, and I uh, I think it's probably going to mean that a few extra people are in the away and for Southport after all. I would think so, Marco. You've spoken quite passionately in previous episodes about the formation and the fact that at times it is very much a five three two. Now on Tuesday night we didn't see any signs of that. It was very much a three at the back, and those win backs they were very effective. No, no, hundred percent. It's what we wanted. It's what we've been crying out for, and. Um... Tuesday was just the word I'm just relief. It was such a huge relief, and yeah, like look, the difference between the first and the second half it was just chalk and cheese. I mean, first I know we went in one nil up, obviously no complaints there, but it was still a bit flat. We didn't really see Barrows pushing forward and Denner push forward like we did in the second half. Um, looking at the second half, like Max said, if you if you put a heat map up, you'd think Barrows are playing right of a front three. Um, I mean, he genuinely played like a winger. Um, really direct, really good. I mean, felt a bit bad for McAwinden because I think he had a really busy night. Um, but yeah, look, a massive shout out with that formation. I don't think that's that's not being you couldn't do that if it wasn't for the likes of Clunan. I thought Clunan were really disciplined in that role, enabling Barrows to push up and um, got, got yeah. the iron bar man in the match. I thought but very well deserved, yeah, rightly so. Rightly so. Like, like I said, last year a lot of his work went unrecognized. I know he got taken a piss scene. He passes sideways all the time. But look, that's football. Every every pass can't go forward. Every every shot can't be on goal. That's Clunan's game. Every manager we've had has played him and started him. And I think he's huge to what we're doing. Um, but no, like you said, I think the uh, the man of the match, and rightly so, in your eyes, was Barrows. And I think he had a really good claim. Yeah, I'll be honest. I thought that was certainly from what I've seen. I've been to every game. I've probably been to what, 75, 8% of the games from the start of last season. That's the best I've seen Barrows perform, actually, in an iron shirt. I thought it was tremendously effective on that wing. I mean, defensively, it looked pretty sound too. But actually, when you play a team like Russia, because of the way our, our centre-backs are so spread out, there's almost no need for them to come back and cover. They, they have got that free reign to attack. Now, you don't know how much of a false position it is because, you know, ultimately it was Russia. But... I guess the proof of the pudding will be in the eating, Max, on uh, on Saturday when we come up against Southport. Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, you can only be what's put in front of you. I, I think back to the to the Oxford point when it was a worse performance and it was a worse result against a side who, you know, were in a very very similar position in the table to Rochelle. 
And and look, you've, you've got to be ruthless in those situations. You just, if they're serious about trying to win the league this season, then playing sides like we're sure we need to take six points. You know, we took six points off them last season, and we still finished second. So you, you hope that it's a springboard. <laughs> the, the same goes for Southport on 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 Saturday, like you say. And you know, I know they weren't convincing wins, but. This South Bar side who we did take six points off last season. And if we're serious about winning the league, then we need to do the same again. And Marco, one thing that stood out for me, and I think I did mention this actually on, on Gareth's vlog, was it was great to see Clunan on those corners, particularly the outswingers, because I often feel when with the inswingers, the way we've been taking corners of the past couple of seasons, we're always in danger of the keeper coming and collecting the ball. Obviously, that risk is mitigated when you have the outswinger. And I thought his service was was pretty good on Tuesday. You know, I think you've got a nail on the head there. But my only, if I'm being really picky about Tuesday, I was so annoyed that he didn't do it more often. I know we went short a few times and obviously we've been working on stuff um, on the training ground, as you saw from a set piece early on in the first half where we've tried a little one-two behind the wall. But yeah, with, with Clunan, like you said, his delivery was spot on, but I just wish with those three big colossuses coming forward from the corners, get it in the bloody box. I, I'm not, I know I sound proper Brexit here, but <laughs> four, four. Yeah, I don't want to see a short pass and then, shit, there's, there's a body there, let's play back and we start again. No, get it in the box. You've got Evans, it could be Boyce, could be Coogan, could be um, uh, Nicholson. One of them's going to win that edit. So, but yeah, like you said, I think I do... I, Look, there's no secret. I think Clunan's got a cracking ball delivery, but I just want to see more of it. Yeah, so, so two bits there. I, I I thought it was really good contrast in the quality of the corner delivery. There were so many against Chester, which were poor. Um, I, I was impressed with the Chester keeper. He was good coming off his line. He was commanding. He was taking all the crosses, all the set pieces. Then you've got to do something different. Whereas actually on, on Tuesday night, I, I thought the set pieces delivery, when we did get them into the box, were high quality. <clears throat> But actually, just on Clunan as well, I thought the fact that the midfield three was Clunan, Beeston and Roberts, if you're going to get outside, that's the system. That's the way to do it. And actually then, Clunan is exactly the kind of complement that you do need to sit a little bit deeper in front of the back three, recycle possession, get it to Beeston, get it to Roberts. Again, I thought Roberts had a really good game as well. I thought he was really creative particularly when linking up with Barrows down that right-hand side in the second half. So I thought Clunan had a really good game. We're not just saying that because we sponsor him. It was bloody true. Um, and I thought he was the perfect foil for what was, certainly in my view, if you're going to play that system, if you're going to play with three central midfielders, they're the three I'd play and that's how I'd play them. I do think against, like you said, it's we have the beauty of doing that at home against a Rod, you respect to Rush or a lesser team like Rush or. Um I can't see us doing that away from home. I don't think he'll play two attackers in Clunan just because it's it's a lot of pressure on Clunan to sort of do that. You you feel like Beeston's going to go wandering off into forward positions. And I think we need Roberts to go wandering off into forward positions. Otherwise, we really do lack that creativity. Um, so it'll be really interesting at Southport if he does swap one of them out for scales to bring that defensive side. Um, so, yeah, but no, um, like Max said, I do think that has to be the three. I think it, it worked really well. I'm not even sure I'd make changes for Saturday, to be honest with you, Marco. Yeah. But I think, you know, it's the best 45 minutes we've played in, what, two months? At, at least to get the ball rolling, let's try and get out Southport. Let's not make it into a game of attrition. Let's not, you know, let them dominate his area league or say that's how we're going to match up and we're going to we're gonna sink to their level. <coughs> Richie Bennett. Um, <laughs> no, it was. So, what we hope, isn't it? I mean, but last year we was all screaming out to play like Tamworth. And uh, away from home, I think we have been doing it. It's, it's been working. Um, so I, I think I think there might be a change. But like you said, I hope we are on the front foot because we've got to back ourselves, haven't we? Like, on paper, we've got the best squad of a division. Let's go show it. But like I said, only time will tell, but let's not be pissy after Tuesday. <laughs> Marco, one, one thing, one player that really stood out for me was Sam Fishburne. I thought he was very effective up top, held the ball really well. Bit of a surprise to me when I saw the team sheet and, and was trying to work out where Beeston would fit into this formation and realised that obviously he's then been moved back into the midfield. So two questions for you. One, how effective and how well do you think Fishburne played? And secondly, what do you prefer with Beeston? Do you prefer him in the midfield or up top? Oh, 
Fishburn, I thought, was brilliant. I thought we sit, we mentioned it's the, it's the world of Barney when is is Satan skating to work? Is hell frozen over? Well, look, don't be surprised if you see him up for a Ballon d'Or at the end of next year. That's all I'm going <laughs> to say. Um, I thought this podcast was just going to be a full episode of fish puns after the other night. Oh, well, okay, okay, okay. Right. I'm going to get thinking um, but no, no. Look, all joking aside, uh, feed the fish. <laughs> you, you forget how young he is. Uh, Butler mentioned right after the podcast saying they asked him to do a job, and I think he absolutely smashed it. I think he's took his chance with both hands. Um, I think it felt really hard done by um, earlier on in the season where we've put a midfielder up front rather than him. And I think yes, uh, Tuesday he's just gone out and thought, do you know what? Fuck it, this is my chance. And um, yeah, I think he did really well. done. He's got no fear, and I really like to see that. He really does have no fear. Um, he's physical. He can win the headers. Look, I, I always see a lot more of him, but I don't know if you see the best out of him with Whitehall. I don't know if I'm if I'm being negative there. I don't know if you see. I don't see them two working together. I feel like they're very similar. Um, that's in, that's in- interesting. Yeah. So Butler actually in his interview. Yeah. The day was very complimentary of Fishburn being able to compliment Whitehall. And to be honest, I probably take Butler's position. I thought when one won the headers, the other one was looking to play off. And when one was putting the hard work in, the other one was trying to drop back and cover out. Personally, Max, I, I thought the two worked really well together. And I, I would want to see that more often. I certainly think, based on that performance, Fishburn has earned his place in the side. Uh-huh. That's a good fish gag. I, I, what, what more do you want? I don't, even think, I don't even think you did that on Port Boys. <laughs> it was a proper sentence. It made sense. Marco's now going for the double face palm. Um, I, yeah, I think it can. I, I also think that it makes Whitehall's life easier. You know, too many times we've seen the centre arms where it's got two on one against him. You know, I think back to the Scarborough game where we didn't just play one midfielder up front instead of fish, but we played two. Um, I, I think even if he's not going to get you 10, 12 goals a season, I think particularly given um, Carlton not being back yet, I think it's worth having him in the side for, for, for two reasons. I significantly prefer Beeson and Roberts as midfielders. I think it allows them to be much more creative for whoever's in front of them whether or not that's White or whether or not that's Fishburne, whether or not that's Carter. And I think it makes Whitehall's life easier. It, it occupies the defenders. It means that they've got two having a bit of a physical battle with them, not just one. It creates more space. So even if he doesn't get you those goals, I think when he's playing OK, and I thought he played pretty well on Tuesday night, those are still two big plus sides that we get from having him up there. So, um, yeah, he's, he's definitely earned um, staying in the side for me on, on Saturday away at Southport. Marco, Carlton's, Carlton Ubezuna's start to Scunthorpe United has been, it's been, well, it's been more, more stop than it has to start. He's not really got going, but fantastic to see him involved on Tuesday and actually did look to make a bit of a difference. Yeah, 100%. We, we, I remember us, us guys saying in our uh, chat that early on in the season, we, you'd think he's probably going to be our player of the season. Um, from what we saw pre-season, he looked lively. Uh, he was getting goals. He looked very quick. Um, so yeah, we was excited to see him this season. But it just feels like we've not been ripped off. But we, we've been, we haven't seen what we signed. If that makes sense, um, I would like to see him up there with your White or, or with your Fishburn. I think that'd work quite well. Um, again, I'm going proper Brexit here with your with your big with your tall guy and your small guy. I'm talking crouching defer, but. Um, no, I just think... Look, they were great fun too. I don't care what anybody <laughs> says. Harry Redknapp, the go. But yeah, no. I'd, somebody off either Whitehall or Fishburne, and I think that could be Carlton. I think that's something you might see in the future. Um, but yeah, look, hopefully he's fit. I know there's been rumours that he's been fit and not been picked, <laughs> but who knows what to believe. But um, no, I think the sooner we see Carlton on the pitch, the better, because look, we know his quality, because look, look at his record from last year. And Marco, just sticking with you, I if if we had to be super negative, we had to really pick and find some something that wasn't quite quite up to it on Tuesday. Is there an argument to say Nicholson was a little bit off it? Hundred percent, yeah, hundred percent. My first half, I think I'm not just tagging Nicholson. I think he'll be the first to admit his passing was all over the shop. 
pick you up a little bit exposed, which is strange in a back five and considering they weren't attacking that much. Um, I thought early on in the season he was one of our best players and really, had, but I just think the last three or four games he has he's not been 100% the Nicholson we saw early on. Um, again, so let's just hope that's maybe a flash in the pan and we're going to get back to the, the Nicholson that we obviously know is better and obviously a really good player. But uh, yeah, I don't think Tuesday was his, his best of games. I don't think probably he's fortunate that we weren't against a better team who would punish. I mean, just standout chance was the one in the first half where he gave it away with a sloppy pass and make count. But again, we talked before the podcast about only conceding five goals. Fitzsimmons don't make that save. It's 1-1 and Donny Rodan's a toxic place when it's uh, <laughs> when something like that goes in. So yeah, um, so I think he got away with one, but nah, look, Nicholson's quality and uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure we'll see the best of him again soon. Max, I thought, for Rushall, I thought Jerry McDonough looked pretty pretty bright on Tuesday night. He, he certainly looked like he'd lost a bit of timber. <clears throat> um, I, I had a lot of sympathy with him. He was he was playing through the middle on his own. The only real time he got any support in open play, I thought, was that chance when Marco talked about when McIlinden probably should have scored, to be honest. He, you know, he, he should have made it one all right on our time. Whereas McDonough was having a play up front through the middle on his own against three pretty big centre halves. Very easy for them to go two on one. Very easy for it to be a big physical battle. I thought Will Evans did a pretty good job in in that physical battle. But look, if you're a striker and you're going away from home and you get beat three 0 and you're getting scraps all evening and you're not really doing a lot wrong and you're doing your best, like that's a tough gig. We we've seen plenty of scrawny strikers struggle with that job in the uh, in the last few years. So uh, yeah, it's uh, hard not to have a bit of sympathy with him really. And Marco. Jude Law obviously omitted from from the squad again. Jude Law, Jason Law omitted from the squad again. <laughs> wow! Now that would be a twist. I think you that get would be a twist. Fans I'm very tired. What uh, a sad. Can you tell I'm tired? I'm very Hollywood. Tired. Jason Law obviously omitted from the side on Tuesday night, and Butler said in his in his interview today that um, sorry, I've gone again. That he he's suffering from a, a thigh strain. So. Do you see a way back into the squad for him in the short term? And do you think it's possible he might end up leaving? Jason, this is. Not Jude. Not Jude. Right, OK. Well, it's different answers. Um, I'm going to be really... I'm going to annoy myself here. I don't think he's got a chance of getting back in. And I don't think we'll see him again in a football trip. Because I, I get what Butler's saying. I, I get why Butler isn't playing him. Because I don't see him in this system. I don't see where he'd fit or where he'd play because he isn't a striker. He's a winger. He is. Roberts can fit into that 10 and it seems to be working for him. I don't want Law playing wing back. I think he's wasted there and I, I don't want him defending. Um, so look, we've, we're stuck with that problem. We've got one of the best wingers in the league and we're not playing wingers in this league. So for both parties, I think it's probably best if he probably moves on and gets a, a, a good club. And look, we're, we're playing three or five at the back we're playing it and that's what I was going to stay so to answer it and to annoy myself I, I don't think we will see him again but look I hope I'm wrong so just just on Jason Law just like Jude, Lou, Jude Law he's, I think he's a fantastic beast and I know where to find him um, that's a good joke I don't also. even get it mate I don't know what that um, means well Marco got it he just didn't like it okay. <laughs> um the way in which I see him getting into this side by default, actually, I think, is if is if Robbie gets injured. Um, you which think is possible. Of, it's very possible. <laughs> yeah, you think of how many games we, we missed Roberts and if Butler still insists upon playing 3-5-2 or 5-3-2, then in my mind, possibly the most likely replacement for Roberts as that number 10 would be would be Law. Um I mean, Roberts' injury record so far this season has been very good and you wouldn't wish that on anybody. But, look, it, it, it depends, doesn't it, if uh, if a club in the National League or somebody towards the top end of our decision comes in for him at, at some point between now or over Christmas or January or what have you, then I'm sure they would think about it. It would be a shame because there clearly is a good player in there and you should build your, your system around the players and not the other way around. But that's football sometimes, unfortunately. Robert's got injured right now. I would panic. I think he's the one position we really can't afford to lose. I think he's he's making more than, more than Whitehall, more than Fitzsimmons. Yeah, a hundred percent more than Whitehall. Hundred percent. 
Who scores? Who scores the goals if White Hall's injured? Not White Hall, a minute. So <laughs> <laughs> I really don't, don't see that support. Roberts is scoring the goals. I, I really do panic. If if Roberts got injured, I feel like we'd lose out ninety percent of our creativity going forward. I really would. Um, again, I don't think Moore's that number ten, so I don't know how we'd replace it. Possibly Beeston, um, but yeah. Right, I think we'll. I think we've just sacked Barry, Marco. Let's have let's have the podcast meeting. We'll, <laughs> we'll just chat for an hour. Well, you you can do that, but you won't stay on track with time, guys. So <laughs> I think I think we'll wrap it up there for the summary of the Russian Olympic game. Pretty in depth there. I think we got through twenty minutes without making a lewd joke. So I'm um, I'm pretty happy with that. And what we're going to do now is we're going to give a fan a bit of praise, a very special fan, and that fan is Mr. Stuart Moore. And as I'm sure we all know, he's done some fantastic work, uh, not just with, you know, the community. I think we've talked about him before on the podcast, but all the fundraising he's been doing for the club lately has been absolutely incredible. Yeah. And actually, he's just came up with a new scheme. And as you know, he he does the football cards every week. I think he does them twice a week. And he uses the money. Traditionally, he would give the money to the club. What he's doing now is he's using that money to buy families who wouldn't otherwise be able to, to make the game. He's buying them tickets to the game and therefore the club still gets the money. So the club's still getting the money and families who otherwise wouldn't be able to go to the game are able to go. And I just think it's incredible. It's, you know, it's quite a discreet scheme that he's doing. He's not mentioning any names or kind of publicising it other than letting people know that it's it's out there and if they want to donate, then they can do. And on that, um, you can obviously donate by buying teams on the on the club on the card, but you can also, if you just want to donate some money, you can contribute towards making sure that families are able to go watch uh, Scunthorpe United. So that's what I I I'm advocating that people can do if they're able to. His scheme allowed nine families to get to the Rushall game on Tuesday night, and has already paid for twelve families to get to the Farsley game next Tuesday. So just want to say a massive well done to you, Stu. That's incredible stuff. And I also wanted to plug his Christmas quiz, which is on Tuesday, the 12th of December at the Atis Arena in the Exec Lounge, which he's asked me to host, actually. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh, look at, look at Barra, I'm an MC. We'll be there. Are we, are we there? We've got a team, haven't we? Yeah. The I and our are entering a team. I would just like to say, in the interest of neutrality, I will not be getting involved. Oh. I am. I will this not. Is, be this is this is this hour. is going to be like that quiz in Phoenix Nights, yeah, where they're trying to win the trying to win the supplier like Japanese <laughs> alcoholic lager, and there's cheating going on everywhere. Yeah, I won't be doing that. So there's, <laughs> there's one more team. There's one more place up for grabs. The teams are between six and ten people. You need to be sixteen or over to take part, and it's only ten pound a team. So if you'd like to sign up, then you can email Stu and he'll get that sorted for you. There'll be prizes on the night. And so prizes for winning the quiz and also for the best retro shirt one. So that's our little plug for Stu Moore and all the great stuff he's been doing. So speaking of plugs, Marco, I wondered if you could spend a couple of minutes talking about a couple of nominations. That's a good, really good said with it. Speaking of plugs, Marco, right. <laughs> <laughs> if the plug fits. <laughs> Jesus Christ. On that note. And this, on that note, I don't know how this has happened, what I'm about to explain now. Um, but yeah, we have been nominated for not just one, two or one. Yeah. Listening to, if, if you listen to this back, I don't know how. Um, it's the Nominee Bible um, Awards, but every year. And obviously, it's just at the end of our first year. So to be nominated is an absolute honour and something we'd never thought we'd actually say. Um, so we've been nominated for the best Nominee podcast um, on the categories there. Uh, obviously, we do a weekly podcast. Um, you're probably fed up with us now, but we only do this because there's so many people listening and watching. Um, without that, obviously, we wouldn't give a shit. So, yeah, thank you to everyone. Um, if you can go and vote us, it's it's pinned on the top of our Twitter. Um, I'll get it onto our Facebook as well, so you can't miss it. I'll put it on the fans page. Um, and you go on there, you can see the non-league category. Um, we've also been voted for the Unsung Heroes. Now, this one is really special because... It's not even done. This is done through somebody who's actually emailed them personally or privately. We don't know who's done it um, and nominated us for obviously with the the just giving to help the players with the wages, um, everything that went on in the club in the dark days. Obviously, it wasn't just us. Uh, it was obviously Brew, uh, Thomas. Uh, look, it was it was everyone. It was all of us. 
Um, so that'd be a really nice one to win because it wouldn't just be us winning, it'd be everyone. Um, so that'd be a really nice one. And then our very own People's Princess, who's too big time to even be on the podcast, apparently. <laughs> um, he's been nominated for YouTuber. And look, everybody watches Gareth after a game. Um, it's people's it's people's hobby, not hobby, it's people's religion. They have to watch Gareth after a game. Um, and look, he's the best at what he does. He's up against some really tough people, but look, if Scunthorpe have shown one thing, it's that we're tough. So if we can vote, just get... Oh, it's really easy. Even I can do it. Um, not that I have, <laughs> but I have voted Gareth. I was going to say, yeah, surely you voted Gareth. Bloody hell. <laughs> and another person I've voted for, well, not person, the Scunny Bunny, uh, the Scunthorpe mascot, is also up for grabs. Um, so look, let's have a clean sweep. Let's show them what we made of. Up, uh, up for grabs? What, like, if you... Does somebody win? Grab his carrot, yeah. Um, <laughs> Jesus. So the the voting ends on Sunday the 27th, so this coming Sunday. So if you would like to vote for us and Gareth, please, can you pause this podcast right now? Get yourself, get your phone open. Go on to Google, non-league Bible, award section, best non-league podcast, unsung hero, best non-league YouTuber, and best non-league mascot. If you could go into those four categories... I vote for us, Gareth, and Scunny Bunny. We would very much appreciate that. When you do that, otherwise, close your phone. Go on. Otherwise, Marco has to eat Scunny Bunny. <laughs> and he will. That's that's yeah, yeah. common inside, isn't it? And, 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 and I'll tell you, I've, I've eaten rabbit, and I didn't think it was any good. <laughs> Let's just clean up. I mean, if we win, we'll be some sort of party, um, and it will just be me and these four fucking non-alcoholic. <laughs> It'll be a pretty team party, but look, I'll no, go. you and Becky drink. I'll be and Becky. Becky. Yeah. Well, the honestly, the Iron Bar will run out of full fat coke. <laughs> um, but no, it, in all seriousness, if you could vote, we'd really appreciate it. Look, uh, this isn't on script or anything, but what these guys do, the work put in every week um, to just bring content weekly. And look, it, it's not just the times we win; it's through the losses. This is a really nice episode because we've won a game in seven weeks um Woo! exactly so yeah thanks everyone so once you've done that you can get back on now press play and resume the podcast where we are and speaking of content we have now our spy in the camp well the spy in the camp segment this week takes us all the way to the west coast and i'm pleased to say i'm joined by well part of the media team at southport fc rob Irwin. how you doing rob hi uh, doing well thank you very much looking forward to saturday yeah, I certainly am. It's going to be a fantastic game, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so this is an opportunity basically for Iron fans to learn a little bit more about Southport FC and right. possibly what they can expect going into the weekend's game. So Southport currently sit in 11th place. How's yeah. that kind of viewed with the fans? Are you happy with that? We are very much, really. Yeah, it's been a funny old season, though. I've been very, very up and down. We're, you know, we started off with two wins and everyone thought, oh, we're going to win this league. It's dead easy. Uh, three, four games later, we're down in 18th place. Um, you know, after a run of bad results, then we win another game. We're up to eighth on before uh, on Saturday, and then lost on Tuesday, and we're down to 11. So it's very, very up and down, and it dep- very much does depend what Southport, which Southport team turns up, because uh, you know at Scarborough they were absolutely fantastic. They put in a fantastic display Tuesday night against a, a very, very, we thought Leamington were excellent. I know people don't think Leamington are a good team, but my goodness, they were they were excellent, and they they give us a run around and uh, whether it was the two games in two long away trips in the matter of a couple of days I don't know but uh, it's very up and down so but if, if we finished 11th at the end of the season I think everybody would be very happy There's a pretty decent return actually that going away to Scarborough and getting a handy 2-1 victory I mean yeah the good side out in the Scarborough they were, they were very good. Yeah, we, we, um, the thing is that we found this with South Shields a week before they played a lot of football out from the back. And one thing with us, we're, we're quite good at getting, getting into teams that do that. If, if people come out, I shouldn't tell you this, should I? Because you'll tell, I'll tell all the players now. But if, if people come at us rather directly, you know, we, we can struggle a little bit. But, uh, you know, the, 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 those two teams were very, very pretty on the eye, if you know what I mean. But maybe not up top, they didn't offer an awful lot. And we, we, we found them a little bit easier to handle than Leamington, who were just wow in your face from minute one and you, you just didn't know what hit us and uh, I'd say to be fair they're the best team we've played this season um, so far so that's uh, interesting yeah it, it surprised us because I think we, we were in a prediction league at Southport and everybody had Leamington at the bottom and obviously Scunthorpe at the top and um, 
you know, we were very surprised, but fair play to them. It's a lovely club. I love going there. It's a fantastic place to go. So, uh, yeah, it's good. So I, I think it's a roller coaster we sell for every season, but this season, you, you just do not know from one day to the next what, what's going to happen. So I suppose it makes it more exciting than uh, than losing every game or winning every game. Well, maybe. I think we'd like to win every game, but it's not going to happen. So, uh, yeah, good stuff. Well, the weight of the world seems to fall on uh, players for Scunthorpe United if they don't win every game. So, uh, yeah. that, that was a factor to going into Tuesday's game against Russia. It was a great, great result. 3 0, we won at home. Yeah. But there was a bit of pressure building, if I'm being honest. That kind of weighs really? heavy on Yeah, it weighs heavy on us at times, I think. So, so far this season, we've, we've played one formation all season 3 5 2. Sometimes it becomes a 5 3 2. We are. I suppose our weakness might be we're quite rigid. Yeah. Uh, is, is it a Southport kind of horses for courses? Have you got one playing style or do you just kind of match up to your opposition? No, he's, he's, he's matching up to the opposition in the main. He's quite flexible with Jim. He's obviously been there a year now. Jim Bentley is our manager. He's been there a year now. And he's, he's, he is quite flexible in, in what he's playing. Um, there's this, this. I think it's a modern phrase. This press, isn't it? They're very keen on the press, and uh, you know that that's how we get it. And a few breakaways. So, um, it, it, you know, it's flexible. And we on Saturday, you know, we have got an awful lot of. Well, we've had quite a few injuries. I don't know who's going to be back. So he's having to adjust accordingly. Um, because at the start of the season, we thought, oh, we've got a really big squad here. But from day one, everybody's just getting injured, and it's I know it's an excuse and you don't want to use it, but we have suffered an awful lot of injuries. And we had a sending off on our first one of the season on Tuesday, but obviously, he'll still be available for Saturday because it takes a week, doesn't it, to come in? So, um, but no, he's quite flexible, Jim, and uh, he's very likable, he's a larger than life character. So, uh, you know, we, 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 we're we quite a flexible side, and like you just, I think, similar to what you said there, it's 3 5 2. Well, I I often say he's playing one up top. Every time I, I say that, because I do the post-match interviews with him, he said, "No, I'm playing two. But I, it looks to me as though you know there's one in the hole. And but I'm not a football tactician, so I, I have to live with what he says, what he tells me they're doing. But uh, I always think, oh, he's only got one up top. He keeps, oh no, I've got two. If you look closely, so we'll see. You've got so, to look really close. Yeah, yeah, you do really. Yeah, so. So a couple of ex-Iron players currently at Southport in yeah. Marcus Carver and Jamie Proctor, actually, a player that was with us about four four or five seasons ago. Was he with you a few we're... seasons ago? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, back when he was in the league, when he was in League Two. Really, yeah. 14 games for us, but only scored one goal and ended up leaving us in the January because he was on loan from yeah. Rotherham. And I think he dropped down to the National League and that might have been the first time he probably dropped down, actually, after that. So how yeah. are they getting on? Unfortunately, Jamie's injured. He's uh, got a bad hip, and he's been out for the last few games. He's a he's a he's a handful at this level. Uh, the games he's played, and when he's been you know going, he, he's he's a good player. Um, well, we like him anyhow. He, he's taken to this quite well, but unfortunately, he has had this injury, which I believe is a bit of a recurrence of something he's had in the past with his hip. So uh, we're just hoping it's not going to be too serious, and, and he's out for a long time. So he's been out for the last few games. Um, but I hadn't realised he'd played for you because he'd been around a bit. I think he's about 14 or 15 clubs, but uh, he's a lovely fellow. He's, he's got his own business now so and he's moved up to the, oh, he lives in this area. So it suits him great to have part-time football at Southport and uh, he's settled in well with everybody. Yeah, and he's uh, he's larger, he's, he's lovely off the pitch, but he's quite a um, quite an aggressive soul on the pitch, isn't he? So I'm, I'm sure he's one of the sort of players that would wind other opposition players up because he's such a big, uh, a big unit. But uh, he's, uh, yeah, he's a good lad. Yeah, certainly an in-your-face kind of player. The the other yeah. ex ex iron player currently at Southport is Marcus Carver. Never really hit it off with us. Really, it was a, no. a stop start. Is is being kind. It kind of stopped from the start. If you see what I mean. Yeah. How's he found life over at Southport? And I, I I got the vibe at the time that it was all to do with being closer to his family and things like that. Partly, yeah, but he's just a legend at Southport. Honestly, some clubs are made for players. And he obviously left us on a decent transfer to Hartlepool. It didn't work out. Then went to yourselves, and he it, it, it just amazes us how he's never done it anywhere else. But uh, you know, he scored thirty-one league goals for us now in in about seventy games. So he's scoring the goals. He lives on the fact that he scored a most brilliant overhead kick in an FA Cup tie against Chorley. So he'll tell you about that any time you'll talk to him. He'll tell you about his overhead kick for for Salpo. But it won our goal of the season by a, a country mile. But he's one of those people. He's got so in with all the fans, with the the backroom staff, 
everybody loves Marcus. He's good with the young kids. He's good with the, my wife absolutely loves him. You know, she, she she's our club photographer and any photo she gets, can I have my photo today? You know, and everything. So uh, he, uh, he, he just adores being at Southport and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And it's one of the places, you know, one of the players, which every, there's not many people, people don't like Marcus at Southport. And we always felt it was a shame that he didn't do well with yourselves or uh, at bigger clubs, but, you know he's with us now, and we'd be lost without him. I think sometimes Marcus suffers because he does get left up on his own a little bit. But he definitely needs somebody to play with him up top. Um, he's he's, he's like at uh, Levington. He was he, he had to come after eighty minutes. He was absolutely dead on his feet because he'd done so much running. Although we were chasing the ball a lot, quite a lot on Tuesday, but uh, he he he's just loved honestly. And sometimes it works, doesn't it, at a club? And sometimes it doesn't. And Marcus is Southport Football Club through and through. Now uh, I don't think the Chorley fans would be because they always thought he was Mr. Chorley when he was there, but uh, he's definitely Mr. Southport and uh, we love him. It was his birthday yesterday, so he's getting on a bit now. He was uh, 31 yesterday, so uh, he, get, he gets a bit of stick for being one of the older players, but uh, he's he's loved. And I think a player, if they are loved by the fans and doing well, it makes them feel better, doesn't it? So, yeah, he's, he's, he's a good lad. And finally then, just looking ahead to this weekend and a little bit further on for the rest of the season, what's yeah. your expectations going into this weekend's game? What would be a good th- result in terms of the season? I think, obviously, we, we know it's our our biggest game of the season. You know, I think I think you suffer, don't you? I think everybody, everywhere you go, Scunthorpe are the team that everybody wants to beat. You know, we've been looking at our ticket sales. We're all, this time normally on a on a Thursday, we'd be probably on about four hundred. I think there's about nine hundred and ninety already. I think there's two hundred and fifty Scunthorpe fans already bought tickets, so you can almost double that with forty eight hours to go. So you know, there could, could be five hundred there, which possibly just Chester might beat that. But you know, that'll be our best away falling of the season. So, but I think. You'll suffer because it'll turn our lot will be up for it as well. So, and I'm sure you find that everywhere you go, Barrow, that you you know you've got people wanting to beat Scunthorpe, and that's something you have to live with, isn't it? It's uh, I, I'm not trying to be a bit of a bully here. But, sorry, careful what I say. You know, giving you a load of rubbish here, but you know you are the biggest club in the league, and everybody wants to beat you. And I think it's uh, you know when you come up, whoever the favourites are in any league, you know. That the, they're the club that everybody wants to be. We have, we have a little survey in our, our program, and the team, you know, we ask all the players which team you're most looking forward to play. It's generally Scunthorpe. Some yes. say Chester. So um, this, you know. this actually caught the eye of a few Scunthorpe fans. I think, yeah. I'm sure at the start of the season, I remember this appearing on my timeline actually, and there was like maybe five or six players had said Scunthorpe, and yeah. the others had maybe gone Chester. So yeah, yeah. I do remember that. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, you know it 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 it, uh, it must be nice for you in a way, but I, I know it's it's big for you, isn't it? You've got to get out this league, haven't you? This season, I think I think from what I've heard, it's crucial that you you do well this season. You've had one season of the fun of National North last season, but uh, you know, but that's what the game. Uh, it's one of the again, uh, we'd love to obviously. It's stupid to say we wouldn't like to win. Of course, we'd like to get the win, but we know it's going to be hard. Uh, I think it's Southport in the past until last season we always had a good record against Scunthorpe. So, but you did the double honours last season. So, uh, but they were both close games. I think you know both one nils. Um, I think at Scunthorpe I, I was there. And I thought we were a little bit unfortunate on the night because it was a very late deflected goal and the manager particularly. Oh, we could have you know we'd have got something out of that. It'd have been good. So, I think you know it's going to be hard. We all know it's going to be hard, but uh, you know we're all looking forward to it very much. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time, Rob. No problem. Well, Max, there were the thoughts there of Rob Irwin, who works on the media team at Southport FC. Quite interesting to hear what you had to say, actually, about Jamie Proctor and, and Marcus Carver up top. Proctor, obviously, injured, as he mentioned there, but Carver, Mr Southport, he seems to be hitting it off. Yeah, he's got he's got a really good record at Southport. I know it didn't quite work for him in his in his time at us, but his, his record at this level stands, stands pretty close inspection. I know a few Ireland fans will be there going, oh, God, there's, there's bound to be in scoring against us um, or scoring in the game on Saturday. And if nothing else, I suppose McAlyn did, did technically score in the game against Saturday. It was just for us. Um, so if um, if Marcus Carver could do the same in a nice cheeky little own goal on the weekend, I, th- I think that would be very welcome. Um, both the games against Southport last season were very tight. Last minute winner, particularly the away game from Max Coogan. So, look... Games like this, and, and I, I believe they're currently 11th. Uh, what I would think of as very, very mid-table, which is um, 
can be a tough away trip. You catch them on a going day. So, um, look, we've I, I'll be there. We, we've just got to try and bring the three points home by hook or by crook, really. And Matt, now this obviously coming off the back of uh, the 3-0 defeat against Leamington on Tuesday night. And interesting to hear Rob say there that actually Southport really struggle with teams that have a go at them. Yeah, but look how we've been playing away. Like Max said earlier, take it to him. We were us free midfield. Let's let's continue where we left off the second half on Tuesday. Um, I know on paper that's really easy to do. Um, but yeah, look, let's hope we do take it to him. But there's some really strange results in this league and they'll continue to be so. So I'm taking the Leamington result with a pinch of salt and let's just hope, like Max said, hook a by crook, let's get three points and get out. Don't have to be yeah. pretty. No, I thought it was really interesting, Marco, where, where Rob was talking about the, the two strikers there and saying how the manager is often in post-match press conferences really labouring the point that it is two strikers, although at times a lot of the fans think it's it's that singular striker. And it got me to thinking about you know, with us and sometimes Butler's stressing the point about three at the back, it's not five. So sometimes I guess, uh, you know, we, us fans see things that managers don't see, don't we? Yeah, 100%. I mean, like, look on Tuesday, that was two up front. It was three at the back and it was two wing backs. Like, for, for you can dress it up as much as you want, but fans, some are going to be right. We're not, <laughs> there's a few who are daft, but we're not daft. And like you said, for, for what we've seen recently, it has been a five. Which I think, which is what's maybe raised a few alarm bells. Um, with them, Jamie Proctor and Carver, you can't really see one of them not being one of the main men up front. You can't imagine Carver pulling off wide, or definitely not Proctor, who's very, very much a target man. Um, so yeah, look, managers have the ways and we try justify things. Um, Butler doesn't need to. It's, it, look, it doesn't matter what he's playing as long as we're getting points. It, it really doesn't matter, and he doesn't have to justify his formation to let alone us. Um, so yeah, look, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> and Max, it's been talked about a lot in the the, the pre game build up, but they mentioned it again in his 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 interview today. Big pitch at Southport, and actually over can can be a bit of a draining surface as well. Do you think that will come into to play at all on Saturday? Yeah. It might do, depending on what the weather's like in the next um, thirty six hours in the. Up in the up in the northwest, but look, it's it's the same for both teams. We have got the option to, to to go long, to be a little bit more direct, to be a little bit more physical. If you feel like the pitch is, is interfering with some of the more slick passing football that we did actually see in the second half at, at home to Rushall on Tuesday, but look, that that's 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 football. I I don't really worry about us defensively. You know, we've only conceded five goals so far this year, which is half the the team for the next amount. And frankly, 40% of the goals we've conceded this year come against Oxford City. Um, so, um, I, I'm, I think we'll keep a clean sheet on Saturday. The question is, can we find the onion bag? Indeed it is. Marco, last season, as, as we mentioned earlier, we did the double over Southport. Was there anything that took your eye when we played them last season? Any kind of alarm bells ringing ahead of the game? Not alarm bells as such, but... So performances last year, especially away, I think there was a lot similar to Southport. Like there wasn't much in it. Um, I mean, for example, the away performance there where Coogan got did you get two Coogan? Do I remember right? He scored in both games. We we won both yeah. games one 0 yeah. yeah. the, the one away, it was late on, wasn't it? Yeah. Look, you offered me that now on Saturday. I'm taking it one hundred percent. Um and it was actually it was a good, genuinely it was having been stood at the in the territory, it was a great moment when Coogan scored like we'd been huffing and puffing a little bit. But <laughs> Do you know what I remember from that day? Sorry, Max, go on, you finish your point. I mean, I hope it's a I hope it's a funny story. But I was just gonna say and actually then when we were walking back to the bus on the on the main road at Hague Avenue, that like, there was quite a few Singapore fans giving his shit. And do you know what? Honestly, inject it. Like the, the 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 fact that that sort of they felt wronged, and the fact that there was you know it felt like a proper game. You, you could have very easily been in League Two and coming out coming out with a win. Um, and and they had given it a go. You know they weren't trying to play five to back in that game. Obviously, it's last season. And when when the goal came, it, it just felt right. I know we won't have Danny Elliott to bring off the bench with twenty minutes to go which worked to treat us at last season. But 
if it's a moment of magic from Roberts or, or Fishburne or whoever else, I, I won't give two figs. What I was going to say, Marco, is do you remember on Gareth's blog when a pyro got set off? And obviously we're not condoning the use of pyros, obviously. And Jackie, <laughs> Jackie was walking in the middle of it with a vape on or a fag or something. And she's like, blown away, no problem. But then like the pyro set her off coughing. <laughs> it was just like the funniest thing I've seen. <laughs> and, and at least I would say, of all places, Singapore, it's, it's a very, very big open terrace. Like the air, you know, the smoke does escape quite quite quickly. So and that's uh, saying bring your pyros. <laughs> Max, Max is not, is not Max, is, Max is saying that I, I can remember Jackie having a fag on the terrace as well. <laughs> She's a card, isn't she, Jackie? Do you remember at my thirtieth when they they said, oh, do you want thirtieth? All the all our podcast viewers are going, oh, don't look a day over twenty five. Not with that. <laughs> oh, there, she is. there he is. And <laughs> go on, Marco, show us yours. I've got none. And even <laughs> hey, uh, what I've seen on Facebook today, Barra's in. Barra's been pulling. Listen, <laughs> Gar- Gareth's not the only one who's adored by the fans, you know, guys. That's all I'm <laughs> yeah. saying. I'm just putting that out there. Does, uh, does, does, does Kat listen to our podcast? Absolutely not. It's <laughs> <laughs> a Barra in person. She's not going to listen to him on a screen. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, my thirtieth. Where there was, uh, do you want? We've got you a cake as well. Please don't do that. And then Jackie runs out of the kitchen with the biggest knife you've ever seen, and she goes, <laughs> "You eat your fucking cake." <laughs> <laughs> so she, yeah. she would make a great like Pat sport gangster in a Guy Ritchie yeah. film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. I can see that. Right. Let's move on to questions from the fans. There was a few questions that we didn't get round to on Tuesday night and I've tried to pick up the ones which are still kind of applicable because a lot of them are around the negativity with us not having one in seven weeks which is now now dissipated so Marco I'll kick up with you and stop the affiliates you're on mate he's been in touch and he says now we are 25% of the way through the season who is everyone's biggest surprise and biggest letdown so far either in your own team or other teams in the division Oh, as individual players or an actual actual. You team? can answer it however you wish to answer it. Oh, that's a toughie. Um, I'm not the same as because he asked the question. I thought Scarborough looked quite good defensively against us. Um, I tipped him to be up there. I don't think we're too far off, but it's still quite tight. That was a cracking um, the, lap the, of honour as well, they're wasn't 14th. it? 14th. They're not in the top half. Yeah, but you say that a couple of wins of a straight back. I don't three think... Point, that... Three points off the playoffs. There you go. <laughs> what I mean, is... Marco, imagine how many laps of honour they do if they made the playoffs. Oh, God. <laughs> like it'll, light, it'll stop the affiliates or light, man. They'd be stopped, they'd be, they'd be having pit stops. They'd be having pit stops. They'd be like, do two laps. Of... Um, well, let's a, go again. The disappointment for me was um, I expected a lot more from Chester. Um and early on pre-season, we all did our sort of um, our predicted league tables. And I'd be surprised if we all, if not all, most of us had Chester in the top two or three. Um, and I think looking at that recent performance on last Saturday, we probably might not be there. So disappointment-wise, I'm, I'm, I'm not disappointed as a Scunfort fan because we managed to go there and get a point. Um, but yeah, they're probably, probably disappointed in themselves. Matt, same question to you? Yeah, so... Look, there's there's still a long, long way way to go, yeah. And and actually, I th- I remember looking at the form tables going into Tuesday, and only two sides going into Tuesday had won their last two. Both lost on Tuesday. It's it's partially why we're still top of the table. There's there's not really been a side yet that's sort of put a big run together and really really stamped on it. Um, in terms of in terms of positive surprises, um, Leamington. Outside, outside the playoffs and goals scored, um, which is a, which is a, a great effort from them. Um, I mean, if you if you'd said before the start of the season that Farnsley would be one point off Kidderminster, you'd think, well, well, what's going on there? Um, and the fact that Farnsley obviously will be playing next Tuesday have, have managed to get themselves into the top half with all of the absolutely. Fucking disgraceful off-field shenanigans and shine that they're having to deal with. 
absolute massive solutions, um, massive applause to them um, for finding solutions in a really, really tough environment. In terms of who I'm a been a bit disappointed with so far, um, probably say Brackley. I think they were my tip to win the league. I think I said, right, they'll finally crack it. I know they're allergic to the playoffs in the bottom half. Mm. And all right, only three points off six. There's still a long, long way to go yet. And they did have fixture wise a very, very tough opening three slash four games. But look, that's football. The margins can be very fine. Any side goes on the win of, you know, getting 10 points out of 12, suddenly you'd be right up there. Do you have something to add, Marco? My standout player that I've seen at Grand Theft year was that Dixon from Warrington Town. Um, big centre mid uh, from them. Just done a little bit of research on him. It looks like he might have gone back to Macclesfield. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm, again, this is Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> but it does say he's had 2024 Macclesfield. Um, so I don't know if he has gone back or, or whatever. But for Warrington, when obviously our players, I thought he, he was a massive standout and didn't expect to see many players like him at this level. So that, uh, yeah, my surprise or positive surprise was definitely different as players. So uh, just to follow that up in terms of picking out one individual player, the one I pick is a, a, perhaps a slight cheat in that it wasn't a Grandford Park. It's not even a player in our league. But when we went to Geisley, their right winger, the the, the 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 number seven, I thought looked a looked a handful, caused a lot of problems for us down the right. He was direct, he ran at Denton. And then you know what it's like, you you're back in the train station or the pub near the train station, you're having a look, and yeah, it turned out he played quite a lot of games in League Two in the National League. And I, I could sort of see why, but that is a whilst we were really poor there, I do I, I would honestly say that I've seen plenty of sides in our league who were worse than Geisley were. You know, if that if that's their performances so far this season, I think they'd have been fine in our division, to be honest with you. We'll, we'll play plenty of worse sides than that this year. Marco Stee, Becky Mayer, has been in touch and he says, uh, is Butler getting slack from the fans considering we are top of the league and we've only lost one league game and it's nearly fucking November? Also, at times, can he be too rigid with his style and selection? Uh, the first bit, look, if Man City didn't win a game in seven weeks, but we're still top of the week, Pep would be getting bellers. Like, there's, like, there's no... I don't think there's any denying that. Seven, seven weeks to not win a game in the league is a long time. I know there was a week... Yeah, just that we did win in the cup, but in the league, that is how yeah. long we went. I know, I know there, was, there was obviously a week off because we didn't qualify for the next round of the cup, but seven weeks is a long time. And look, you, you're looking at the, the fixtures in, within that. We're Warrington at home. We're Oxford City at home. And we are expected to win those games and with all due respect win them well not not 2-1 not and obviously 1-1 one, one. so look we, we say it every week now fans are going to have their opinions no matter who's in charge they are not dogs abuse I wouldn't say it was dogs abuse but people are going to have their opinions and um, mm. it's something Butler will I'm not saying get used to but it's something that he will pick up and look as long as he's winning games he's not had any abuse this week um <laughs> So, yeah. Uh, what was the second bit? Oh, is he too rigid? Is he too rigid? Um, For Rigid. I know. <laughs> I'm not asking Butler out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we get onto the loop. Congratulations, <laughs> Mr. Um, no. It's you. That wasn't me or Marco. That was you. R- rigid is a harsh word. Look, he... It is in the bedroom. <laughs> I think we're seeing. I think we're seeing a shift between five at the back and a three at the back. I think we're probably leaning towards more of five away. I don't think that's a secret. And what the problem was, which is coming back to the first point, is I think we were seeing five at home. Um, as long as that is a three, and we do see your Barrows and your Dentons playing as wingers like we done on Tuesday, like it can be as rigid as he wants. I don't care. Uh, this fluid football, not for me anyway. And Max, next question coming from Carol Birch. She says, do you think Whitehall is still carrying an injury? He seems to have lost a bit of the fire that he had at the start of the season. And does the panel think Laura's been overlooked? I guess we've already talked about that. But then the next bit is, do we think the panel, does the panel think that the negativity from certain fans is having an effect on the team? Uh, do I think Whitehall is still carrying an up? Yes, I do. Um, I think we've seen that in, in plenty of games this season where he's maybe not quite as mobile, not quite as much zip, 
Um, but they're, they're very, very reliant on him up, up there. And I think there's been plenty of games this season where White has gone off or he hasn't been playing or whatever it is. And you can see that we're a poorer side without him. I know some of his antics can get a bit close to the line and he's not always everybody's cup of tea. But especially without Danny Elliott, you know, this isn't last season. We are a poorer side without Danny Whitehall in it. Um, in terms of, you know, the negativity from certain fans. Look, I, I, I've said it before and I will say it again. When, when you sack Dean in the summer, because he wasn't out of contract, when you sack him, you send the message that second is a failure and people will behave accordingly. Look, it was a rough seven weeks, six, seven weeks. If they now go and put a little run together, nobody will remember that. You know, football is the absolute embodiment of the king is dead, long live the king. So all any of us want is three points. All any of us want is promotion. And I wonder what, you know, I, I've heard quite a lot of fans say it within the last week, and I do agree with them actually, in that, you know, last season to win the league, we would have bought needed 95, 96 points. Maybe even more if Tamworth hadn't been able to take the foot off the gas sort of the last three, four weeks of the season. We might not need that many this year. We got 88 last season, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, that, at this rate, that could be enough. Yeah, maybe um, a couple more. Maybe yeah. maybe 90, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, the difference, particularly if you're dropping points at home to the likes of Warrington, the likes of Chorley, the likes of Oxford City, the difference between having to get 90 and 96 is, is actually massive, mm. especially when you think back to last season that we did have more quality in certain areas. But Cal Roberts was out injured for, what, good six months? And exactly like Marco said, well, if, if that happened now, this season, we'd, we'd really bloody notice the difference, wouldn't we? So, um, look, it's it's football sometimes. You, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Right, that wraps up our questions from the fans and we've literally got two minutes on the clock before we hit the hour. So, Marco, I wonder if you could give us a quick <coughs> FPL update. Well, I'm going to quite enjoy this week because I had a cracking week. Um, look, White Butler, it pays to stick to your guns. And I said, Howland, I didn't fancy Howland this week. I thought he'd blank um, and he did so. So I swapped to Son. But as for the podcast standings, Barry, you're not bottom which is mental considering you're under. Again, there's 280-something people in this league. So <clears throat> to be in the top 100, you are doing well. I'm going to class that top 100. You're doing well. Well, I, uh, am. I am in the top 100. Yeah, go on, we're on. You'll be fine. Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> it is the top 100. Hey, no worries. You call it what you want. Uh, oh, no, sorry, sorry. If you finish fourth, right, and you get a Champions League spot, have you finished in the top four? How many people are joint 100? Just me, on my own. Definitely. 100%. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway, you're doing well. Uh, we've got Gareth, the People's Princess, who is missing in action, by the way. <laughs> um, is he okay? Um, sorry? Is he okay? He'll be fine. He'll be fine. He'll be vlogging something. Um, he's 146. Then we're working our way up. We've got Max in 84th. I, I had an awful week. It was very low scoring <laughs> for a lot of people, I think. I wonder if we could get... A full eye in our panel in the top 100 by the end of the season. That'd be some going. Um, then we've got me in 33rd. I had a really good week because of my uh, managerial prowess. <laughs> and then Becky, despite being ill, that's why she's not here tonight, has had an absolute barnstormer again and gone to 27th. Um, so yeah, we're all doing really well. Uh, big weekend this weekend because... A lot of the big teams are playing each other again. I think we've got um, Arsenal, Liverpool. Arsenal obviously got a lot of injuries with Saka, Odegaard, Calafuris. Um, so make your subs accordingly. Uh, but yeah, that's no, really interesting. Paul Crute's still at the top. Uh, it's been there for a couple of weeks now. So look, it's really top. It's tight at the top. So um, if anyone can knock him off his perch, let's go for it. Right, I think we're, we're just in there. We're about 59 minutes. So thank you very much for listening once again to the Iron Hour podcast. Thank you for your continued support. Thank you for deciding, making that decision to tune in every single week. We really do appreciate it. What was that? Vote for us. <clears throat> please, please. Next week, Bible. Uh, normally, normally podcast of a year, unsung heroes of a year. Gareth, you all know it's the best YouTuber of a year. So get your fingers, click them buttons. Come on, let's do it.
Right, thank you very much. See you next time. Up the iron. Up the iron.